Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for calling in for this talk. Actually, we're going to talk about learning symbolic equations with deep learning today. Um, I'm Shirley Ho from Flatiron Institute with uh, multiple joint appointments, which I'm not going to keep going on. I'm showing work that are led, that is led by Miles Kramer, who's a graduate student at Princeton, and Rory Hsu is also a graduate student at Princeton, with a collaborator from uh, DeepMind and Peter Vitagli and Alfredo Sanchez, and also David Spergo, who is the, um, currently the director of Compass Center for Computational Astrophysics at Flair Institute, uh, and Kyle Kramer at NYU as a faculty there. Um, I guess a lot of them might not need any introductions, but I would like to point out that this paper was published at NURBS 2020, um, and I will show a lot of slides from Peter Battaglia, and let's start now. So this, we're going to start from a very language perspective. We'll start thinking about how to understand a scene like this for a lot of parents in the pandemic. Um, fortunately, we see a lot of these where the toy box is sort of attached to the shelf and then you have the guitar that might be hit by the toy box and then you have the shelf that might be falling off. We humans tend to parse the situation into physical objects and relationships. And we think about how things are interacting with each other at some level, whether the floor is supporting this, is this gonna fall and hit the guitar? Is there attachment between this toy box and the shelf? We reason about the objects and their interactions very often. So we might describe it as precarious, for example, and we kind of condense all the information to one word. And this is something very similar to the intuitive physics engine that have, we have in our head. We can call it the physics engine in our head. We have some inputs to say a bunch of blocks. And then there is a lot of situations afterwards that we kind of play out in our head. So at time t, what will happen? Time t equals to you know t plus one. What's the next step? What's the next step? Does it collapse? Does it fall? In which direction if it does? What happened basically next? And that's what we've been thinking about a lot just as a human being and as a scientist, it is very often the case, something we will make a prediction and assume that prediction is true, you know, play out in our head what happened next and try to see whether our prediction is correct. That's the scientific process at some level. And we do a lot of experiments, right? Sometimes in our heads, sometimes through our simulations, sometimes there are actual experiments where you have to build something and see what happened. So for example, here we have an experiment that has a bunch of blocks stacked up on top of each other. And we ask ourselves and the network that's being trained, whether it is gonna fall off ranking from one to seven and see how humans and machines compete and see which one will be more accurate at predicting whether it will fall. And if it does fall, which direction does it fall really? So we have a lot of interesting possibilities of which direction it might fall as it's turning and both machines and humans will have to make some guesses. And there are different masses you can put in there and making predictions of what happened next whether it falls or not, depending on how the masses are changing. And there's much more complex scenes like the one below where you have an external force hitting it to this table, which it contains both the red and the yellow blocks. And you can see how and when and where these blocks might be falling to. And it depending on whether there's a railing protecting it, which makes basically the yellow blocks less likely to fall off. Both the machine and the humans can make these predictions and you can even do a much more complex ones like inferring the masses of the system by observing a system and how it falls in different interesting situations. You can also sort of make a guess where the fluid will be more likely to more fluid on the left or on the right, depending on say, what are the particular configurations of these blocks lying around. So there are many experiments we can do both in real life and in much more you know, simulated situations. As a scientist or as particularly astro astrophysicist, we do a lot of these every day. We ask ourselves, can we predict what will happen? For example, at t equals to t zero, here things move forward a tiny bit. We predict the next step of these planets moving around this star, which is their sun. And then you go to t one and make the prediction for t two. 
and see where it goes next. So by observing these systems, sometimes if we're lucky and if we work really hard, we might figure out the rules that govern them. Um, this is the famed Isaac Newton apple tree. Well, it's at least one apple tree in Isaac Newton's mansion, I guess, at that point. Um, so are we gonna be like Isaac Newton and just look at these systems and bodies moving around in the sky and see what happened next? Pardon the very familiar New York City noise with you know all the emergency vehicles. Um, can we figure out the rules that govern them? You know, these planets moving around here. Can we figure out it is F equals to basically M1, M2 between the two masses over R square? We observe the planets moving around. Can we figure out the physical law that govern the motions of the planets? We can either work super hard and came up with it like Newton, or we're gonna do something different called symbolic regression. Um, this is something that we don't talk about a lot in deep learning usually, but I will argue that with the correct inductive bias or particular architecture development that are suitable to the system, we can see a possibility of unwrapping what the network is learning. And symbolic regression belongs to this family of um, topics where it, include, where it includes genetic programming, evolution and programming, for example. But what is it exactly? So we're gonna talk about a little bit what symbolic regression is. We don't pretend that we invented it. It's been around for a while. Um, basically you have a bunch of mathematical functions and variables. We form new equations every time you see a bunch of these functions and variables, and then you go back and check, well, do these you know, functions predict the correct behavior the next time step? And then we check whether these new equations fit. So if, so if it doesn't, you basically switch some of the components and how you switch and how you search in this space is more an effective search question, which we're not gonna dive into it, but um, the current set of uh, symbolic regression packages um, works and it has issues in terms of it has to deal with the fact that there's a very large space to search for the right equation and sometimes it's not as effective so you can't just give it a huge number of possibilities of you know variables to search otherwise it will become explosively large in terms of you know the space it has to search um, we also so originally when this paper was written we used a package called Eureka and it was good. And we decided that, however, since it's not a publicly available package, we rewrote the whole thing and, you know, from scratch and wrote a new symbolic regression package called FISAR that can be downloaded online very easily. And it works very well. Um, so how do we do this? So we now observe the systems. We try to figure out the rules that govern them. But you know, if it is what's that easy, then all the neural net architectures that we can try to use to sort of unwrap what this black box is doing, what people like to call it black box, what this network is doing. It's not as obvious, but we'll show in this talk where you can in principle use inductive bias, which is basically a way to describe an architecture that has some physical intuition or prior knowledge in it. So that it helps inform us what architecture um, setup we should have. So in this case, in this n-body system, we find out that graphical neural net actually helps really well in predicting dynamics of so n-body systems. And so we decided to do that. And we combine a graphical neural net, which we can sort of pluck out parts of it really easily. And with symbolic regression, I will show you hopefully by the end of the talk that um, it's able to predict and the laws that it observed by first of all, predicting the dynamics correctly using graphical neural net and then extracting parts of the graphical neural net which are relevant to these force laws and getting the force laws by using symbolic regression. So let me show you how that works. Um, so now we're gonna do these two steps as I described earlier. We have simple particles moving around in this data set and we'll predict the dynamics of this data set by a bunch of particles moving around. It's not entirely trivial as you probably could have guessed because these are chaotic systems. Anything more than you know, anything three body and above are chaotic. We model it with graphical neural net which surprisingly predicts quite well. And then we will extract to symbolic equation later on. And let me show you how we did it. <laughs> 
But first thing first, let's to make sure we can make the predictions and compare and update weights, which is the very generic neural network stuff that we all do. We throw in a data set to a network. We make the network update the weight as you make comparisons to its predictions. It's not so different from it, except we're going to use graphical neural net. And I'm going to explain what graphical neural net is a little bit. This is a kind of graphical neural net we are using. It's called symbol, uh, interaction network. Um, but it is very similar to other kinds of uh, graph, GNN also. A graph is a natural way to represent entities and the relations, like how we described early on, where we have this shelf and this box and the ground guitar, right? And you can see how these nodes, which are V1, V2, V3, correspond to entities, objects, and even events. And you can use these edges that correspond to the relations, interactions, and transitions. The inference about entities and relations respects the graphical structure. And it is important that the graphical structure is in this particular way. And why is that? Because this will help us at some level not to create so many extra parameters that are not useful at some level. So we'll, we'll describe how this is a little bit better later. The graphs can capture many complex objects and relation systems. For example, this is an H2O, this water molecule. You can see that these H have very strong bonds with the O and thus you, know, you can have this multi-directional edges that talks in between these, these uh, atoms. You can have mass spring system where the spring is connected and so represented by a bunch of nodes where they are talking to each other. But the N node, for example, can decide to not have this direction being added upon it. And while the mass here will act upon all the nodes, but not the connection among the springs. So there are decisions to be made exactly how you would describe this system that you're trying to model with a graphical neural net. And for the NBOT system, it's much probably simpler at some level because it just all the bodies interacting with each other. So it's a fully connected graph. There's a richer body system where you can imagine the wall is one node which acts upon all the other balls. While you know, assuming the wall is not moving around, it's being bounced off by the wall by the balls, we can just say, you know, we, it's a unidirectional edge in only one direction. And then you can also parse sentences in this way into trees, which are very, you know, very familiar for people who do NLP, but you can decide whether this is the right architecture to use. For images and fully connect a scene graph, you can also imagine doing this. But I would argue that for images, um, convolution neural network architecture probably makes more sense. So, maybe diving in a little bit more about the interaction network to specifically how we're going to do this. We have these edges, V, the nose Vs, and this global quantity U. For those who are physicists in the crowd, the U could be sort of potential energy, total angular momentum, total energy could be the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian. For those who do a little bit more of um, physics um, in theory, and for those who are more pictorial, I guess, or graphical when they officially envision this um, architecture, you have the edge block where you look at the edge functions and you have this node block where you really care about how the edges act on top of the node and the node will get updated depending on the edges. And then you have this global block which you care about exactly what the global quantities will affect the nodes. And let me just describe a little bit um, all each of the functions a little bit. So there's an edge function, which would take in all the edge attributes, all the attributes belonging to this edge, particularly this one, and it's a receiving node and a sending node. So this is a receiving node, a sending node for this edge and the global quantities. And combining all that, it would compute the edge function for this update. And then you have the node function where it basically updates the node by looking at the, all the edges that comes to it and the edge attributes of all the edges, the node attributes itself and the node state, 
at the previous time step or the current time step, depending where you're going next, and the global quantity. And you update the node info from the previous node state and aggregate all the messages from all the edges. And depending, and for our work here, we did not actually end up using the global quantities, but you could imagine using global quantities, which for scientists, it could be very interesting to look at so conserved quantities and how that helps the network to be very effectively trained. Um, we end up training to predict the node states from T0 to T1 for a bunch of different systems. And I'll show you some of the systems below. Um, we're gonna start with a case study, which is looking at the planetary interactions. Each planet is a node, X, Y, the positions and the mass. We're only doing 2D for this case, just for simplicity. We've also done 3D later on. For any pair of these planets, there's an edge in this cool, fully connected graph. Each edge is a function of two nodes. We'll update each node depending on all the edges at a point and its previous you know, position and mass. And at this point, a lot of scientists might be very, feeling very you know, familiar with what the graphical neural has described because it feels so much similar to a simple n-body systems or Newtonian mechanics where you have this strong analogy looking at nodes. It could be like a bunch of particles, pairs of nodes are two interacting particles. I'm not saying this is always true. This just looks very and a lot. It's a good analogy to show for those who are very scientifically inclined. And then there's an edge model where you can imagine is what the force is computed. There's an edge mess. The messages will be computed um, after you get the edge model understood. And once you get the messages, you pull them, which means you're summing all of them in a specific way into sort of net force so that you will affect the node in certain ways. We don't know what the edge model is, right? If we don't know the science, but you can imagine the node model will be taking so some pulled forces from all the edges and divided by the mass of the node. And once you did that, you can update the node and see, you know, you could do a comparison and see whether it works. If it doesn't, you update the edge model and the node model until this will work really well. Um, as I said earlier, here are specific places where you can sort of pluck out a chunk of the graphical neural net so that you can approximate these no functions and edge functions with symbolic regression. And how we did that specifically, um, I'll show you later, but let me show you some of our predictions. We have tried the Envoy systems, balls bouncing within the wall and sort of like a you know, spring mass system. And on top is the truth, on the bottom is the predictions and you can see that the n-body system is doing quite well. The boss bouncing within the wall has a little bit more chaos and you can feel like it's not predicting so well very quickly because tiny, tiny difference will make huge differences. The string on this ball, it's working okay. And we can even generalize it to larger system with this zero shot generalization here. What it means is that the system has, the network has not seen this many balls or this long string at all. And so we can imagine basically um, letting the network predicting the next time step without actually being trained at all. And it works for many bodies. Um, if I remember correctly, it stopped after say, I don't know, 15 bodies or something like this for the n-body system. And the balls have to remember, but it's approximately that number too. And as I mentioned earlier, there's an interesting connection to the conserved quantities, which I will just spend like a minute on um, advertising work that we recently did also called Lagrangian Neural Net. That's also led by Miles Kramer and um, Greg Grandan uh, Sam Grandanis, who wrote the Hamiltonian Neural Network. Neural Network. Um, you realize that we can use Lagrangian Neural Net to predict much better and more efficiently the next time step of a bunch of particles. And Lagrangian is sort of the total quantity that is conserved. So you can take derivatives or gradients, how you like to describe it, and get the positions and velocities of the particles for the next step. But what the network is predicting is really truly the Lagrangian itself. And I think it's pretty cool to think of, you know, doing 
the graphical neural net with the conserved quantities in mind for the global quantities, for example. We haven't done that yet, but that's definitely a possibility. So now that we talked about all the possibilities of the systems that we can use to sort of train our neural nets, which are graphical neural nets, and it makes really good predictions once you train it, and even generalize this to you know, larger number of bodies for the system that it has not seen before. So the zero shot generalization work. And I would like to talk about how do we sort of pluck out the specific parts like the edge model and the node model from the graphical neural net into the symbolic regression part so that you can do a much better, how should I say it? So can you do a much better generalization sometimes if you can get an actual analytical formula for what the edge and the node model is doing. So that's that, let's see what happens. So we have this one challenge left, which is to extract the symbolic equation. We got this prediction of dynamics working. What we did is that we encourage or push the network to have a very low dimensionality to represent the edge model or the node model. And we did this by using something called L1 regularization. So first of all, you have this network, we train it and we record all these messages. But instead of allowing it to be a really large message, we want to have it to be a very small number of elements. And given the input simulations we showed earlier is only 2D, we do not expect the dimension of the edges factor to be larger than two. So we first try putting in basically say, okay, you can only have two elements and see what happens. When we did that, um, limiting it to two immediately makes training longer and the performance is not as good. So then, you know, we said, well, we should try all these other things. So we try a bunch of things and in the end, it's L1 regularization seems to work the best. It minimizes the number of message elements that are important to fit the observable to the predictions. And it also trains pretty fast. So we decided to do that and take the edge elements that were left after the L1 regularization through symbolic regression and see what we fit for the two elements that are like basically at the end. And we find out that the edge elements themselves are rotation of the true force. So that when you combine those two elements together, you will get the force law basically. And we also found force laws recovered in the same manner for springs in 2D and one over R squared in 3D. So it is kind of interesting to see that you can actually extract not only analytical expressions out of these you know, message elements that you don't really know what they're supposed to be usually, um, but also that these message elements actually correspond to real force laws that we sort of know and love for a very long time. So this is the plotting the message elements one, the message element two, with respect to the linear combination of the forces. And you can see that they basically one to one, which is kind of cool. So we sort of like, you know, wrote this paper and realized, okay, this is cool. But people keep asking us, you haven't done anything that we don't already know. Because, you know, we knew Newton's law for a very long time, right? Um, so we decided to do something a little harder. So here is, um, and body simulations, actually it's hydrodynamic simulations too, which has a bunch of dark matter moving around these blue dark matter particles. And then you have also hydrodynamic simulations going on where you see a supernova exploding right there, which is right here. And you can see this very complex simulations going on where a majority of the matter is something called the dark matter. And there's like a huge cluster in the middle where many things are happening and, oops, sorry. And then you can see that this is not entirely trivial to say, can I get the total, well, can I get the density in the center say of this halo, assuming we have the halo mass of all the other halo around it. So let's formulate this question again. If I give you a whole set of halos, which are these like big cluster of dark matter particles. These dark matter particles form huge amount of stuff in the universe. It's actually most of the matter in the universe are in form of dark matter. The baryons are the stuff that we know very little, what know most about, and the dark matter is the stuff we don't know very much about. But we know it's there because they exert gravitational forces 
in its surrounding bright elements, which are the baryons. So we know they're there. And so now with these big, you know, cluster or cosmopolitan cities of galaxies, we call it the halo, can I get the central density of this, you know, cosmopolitan city, basically, assuming you have all the other halos around it. I guess if you rephrase this question as, if I give you the, say the density, uh, give you the total number of people in all the cities around New York City, for example, can you get the number of people in New York City, but as like uh, per square area in the center? That's the equivalent of that, except you know the people here are dark matter. So that's the question. Let me try to rephrase this again. I know for those who are not cosmology, this sounds weird. Um, what is the density of dark matter within the center of the dark matter halo? The dark matter halo basically clusters of galaxies given the surrounding halos. We can make guesses of what this answer may be like, but we truly don't know the answer because we don't know any analytical formula from previous work and we haven't actually thought about this question before for some unknown reason. Because usually when we simulate you know, dark matter halos, we say, okay, um, we have a mass of the halo counting so number of particles in that halo. And in real life, if you observe the sky, you look at the speed of the galaxies within a certain halo to find out the total mass of the halo. So now the question is flipped around and asked in an interesting way so that we don't know the answer ahead of time, which is if I know all the surrounding halos masses, can I get the central density of this center halo? So here's, we have a detailed dark matter simulation, which is full and body simulations with all the gravity that's required to make things happen, running over, you know, bazillion of years. We then put it into a graphical neural net where you encourage this low dimensionality of all the edges. And then you give it the mass of the central halo and you give it the mass of all the other halos surrounding it. We want to extract the central density of this halo right here. So without further you know, delaying the satisfaction, we are gonna show you the answer right away. Um, we find new analytical formula that fit to the observation better than what we can fit using physical intuition because we don't have any formula. So we just try basically. So we try of course, so constant, just assuming that you could be a constant. You can fit for any of constant though. And we also try something reasonable where EI is a sum of all the masses around the central halo and you let it float with all the different constants. And this is the mass of the central halo and see whether it fits okay. And it turns out to fit quite okay. It's not so bad. And it turns out that the symbolic regression actually after seeing what the neural net was doing, find a formula that we did not expect. It's this formula like this. It's not immediately obvious why the formula is this way, but it does perform much better than our simple or you know the best guess that we can make with you know basically fitting the same number of variables in terms of the constants and allowing to have the mass of the central halo and the masses of all the other halos around it. And so the question is, you know, do we learn a better understanding of the universe? Probably not yet, but we do have an analytical expression that does better, so like an effective expression that does better than what we would have guessed. And then the next step for the scientists in the crowd will be to say, can I get an understanding of this equation? And so far we haven't done it. Um, we we'll look forward to work on this in this new year. And then we also allow ourselves to say, okay, Let's say you don't have the mass of halos, as I said earlier, for observations, you only allow the velocities of the subhalos, which could be like the galaxies. Can you get a better expression? So this one, if you use only the velocities of the halos and the subhalos, you get a pretty decent expression also that performs pretty well. And it's not as good as the one that you're allowing to use mass. But the lesson of the story here is that yes, you can get an interesting expression that hopefully will guide you to a better understanding of the science behind you know, the central density of the halo of this cosmopolitan cities of dark matter particles called dark matter halo.
but we don't really know yet what this understanding is. And I think that will require more work in the future. And I really invite, you know, sort of the physicists in the crowd to sort of think of how we will go from analytical expressions to understanding. So this is the part we haven't solved yet, but we're very excited what you can even get sort of effective expression of what's happening. So let me conclude here. Human intuitions and physical intuitions help us create new ways of thinking of how to do machine learning. These new ways of doing machine learning, all such as graph neural nets, help us simulate what we see in the real world way faster. What's more intriguing is that even for physical laws, we don't know the answer to. We can observe the system and let ML help us find analytical expressions. And thank you for listening and stay safe.